Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming to the Henry County Historical Society tonight. My name is Daryl Radford. I'm the co-director of the Henry County Historical Society, and I'm also the official Henry County historian. Tonight, our presentation is entitled Tale of Two Strikes, looking back at the Chrysler and Perfect Circle walkouts of the 1950s, their causes, effects, and legacies. Before we begin, a personal note. This is my late father and mother, Jim and Elva Radford, natives of Burksville and Albany, Kentucky. Neither had much more than an eighth grade education, yet they raised four children, all of whom earned college degrees from Ball State University. In addition to having loving parents, there was one other major reason that Ron, Daryl, Cheryl, and Donna were able to do that. The United Auto Workers Union. Dad worked 30 years at General Motors in Muncie. He earned a good wage and was able to provide a great environment for Donna, a future teacher of both troubled use and adult literacy students, Ron, a future State Board of Accounts supervisor, Daryl, a future journalist, and Cheryl, a future special education teacher and Kids Corner preschool director. Mom was a tower of strength behind the scenes, caring for four children and seven grandchildren. They were two of many who came here from Kentucky for factory jobs, part of the migration of people that would bless Henry County for generations. And so it is those people, the thousands of good union people who made Henry County home that I dedicate this presentation. It's time their good name be restored. The year was 1947. Gas was 15 cents a gallon. A loaf of bread cost 13 cents. You could send a letter for 3 cents. Newcastle was a booming city with a busy downtown as seen in this photo. Chrysler Corporation was a big reason for that, employing nearly 5,000 people. Life in the present moment was good. Huddleston's book, and we have a couple copies of that book out in our gift shop if, any, if anyone is interested. Richard Huddleston writes, In the years before President Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal, old age often brought poverty. The vast majority of workers in the mass production industries had no pensions at all. They either kept working until they died, or if no longer able to work, were taken in by relatives. There were also county poor farms that took in the destitute elderly. I remember such a farm near Memorial Park in Newcastle. How many remember the poor farm here? <clears throat> Enter Walter Ruther. He was the longest tenured UAW president, serving from 1946 until his death in 1970. And this is from Richard Huddleston's book. Speaking before a crowd of 7,000 Ford workers all over 60, UAW President Walter Ruther drove this point home. If you make $285 an hour, referring to Ford Chief Negotiator John Buggis, they give you a pension. But if you make $1.65 an hour, they say you don't need it, you're not entitled to it, and furthermore, it's socialistic. Ruther also pounded home the UAW slogan for the strike, too old to work and too young to die. The slogan spoke to a real problem facing American workers in 1950. The battle for pensions came to Newcastle in January 1950. Here the Union Hall is prepared for an evening meeting. And again from Richard Huddleston's book. After winning pensions for Ford workers in 1949, the UAW made the demand for pensions a central aim in its contract negotiations with Chrysler in 1950. <coughs> Furthermore, the Union demanded that these pensions had to be paid for by regular contributions to a pension fund that made them actuarially sound. Chrysler refused. Chrysler was willing to commit to pensions for its workers, but it was unwilling to establish an independent fund and make contributions that would pay for future pensions. Essentially, Chrysler offered a promise. Trust us, they said. The company asked employees to accept its word and avoid a strike. When the votes were tallied in this union hall that we see a picture of, the voice of the rank and file was heard loud and clear strike. The strike began at 10 a.m. Wednesday, January 25th, 1950. In all Chrysler plants and all Chrysler plants around the country, they had a walkout. By prior agreement between Chrysler and the UAW, office and maintenance workers were allowed to continue working. Here's a picture of pickets by the main gate to the machine shop 
and you see a big crowd there. The Newcastle Courier Times issued a statement. In a statement that appeared in the Courier Times on January 26, the day after the strike began, Chrysler ridiculed the Union Kitty Fund. The statement went on to say that, quote, Chrysler pays wages regularly. It pays its bills regularly. Its pension and insurance payments would be just as sure and sound. It also criticized UAW leaders. Calling Chrysler employees on strike in the face of pension and insurance benefits Chrysler has offered shows again how difficult, if not futile, it is to try and do business with people who do such irresponsible things. The statement concluded by charging UAW leaders with putting its employees through unnecessary hardships. Again, that's from uh, Richard Huddleston's book. The management also claimed the strongest assurance of pension payments is Chrysler's guarantee, again, trust us, backed by the full credit and resources of the company. And they estimated that nationally, Chrysler employees were collectively losing $1,188 per day that they were in the strike mode. And Richard Huddleston commented it may have been this statement that persuaded my parents they would never gain enough from the strike to make up for the lost wages. Kind of put everybody in a bind. The strike dra dragged on and on, and here's pictures of tents that were set up outside the plant. And you see these roadblocks, these big uh, cement boulders, it looks like, making sure nobody could drive in. It was hard for many families. And the Indianapolis Star wrote a story. And part of the story read, what happens to a city of 20,000 persons when 4,200 of its 6,600 working population have almost all or most of their income shut off for 100 days? Lots of people, growing school children included, don't eat nearly as much. Some men without families to care for became professional loafers. There was a silver lining, however. The Indianapolis <coughs> Star article continued, the biggest discovery by those hardest hit is that Newcastle, its collective citizenship, has a heart. This story really gets to me. Mayonnaise sandwich, anyone? Shortly after the strike began, civic and labor leaders learned that some of the children of strikers attending Hernley Grade School were eating nothing more than mayonnaise-centered bread sandwiches for lunch. And that's from the Indianapolis Star. How many remember the Hernley School? Um, and this is a postcard of what was then first known as the South School, and it was later changed to Hernley. As has often been the case in Newcastle history, uh, civic organizations came to the rescue. Principal Leonard Ireland at Local 371 of the CIO United Auto Workers and civic organizations got busy. Funds were contributed without the necessity of a formal drive, so sufficient food could be purchased to feed all lacking proper nourishment at home. And at the time this article came out, it says that the week before, 214 needy students were being fed at school. The union also contributed several thousand dollars worth of food directly to families of needy strikers. So often when you think of unions, uh, some people think of uh, rebel rousers and, and troublemakers, uh, but uh, there's a lot of union people and Gene and I have talked about that. Gene had this in his presentation. A lot of union people donated a lot of money that, for a lot of good causes in Henry County, and this is just one example of that. A strike kitchen was established across the street from Chrysler. With grit and determination, Local 371 stood its ground. A strike kitchen was established on I Avenue just across from the Chrysler to feed pickets during the strike. Members of Newcastle UAW Auxiliary 59 made up of wives of men employed at the Chrysler, worked in the kitchen. And there's a picture of some of those ladies in the auxiliary, uh, made up of wives of UAW Local 371 members. They did the work in the strike kitchen during the long strike, and here in this picture, they take a lunch break of their own, and I'm sure it was well-deserved. Finally, an agreement. The strike went on for 104 days. With their backs to the wall and their stomachs empty, the UAW rank and file held out, and they won. The long strike was worth it. Here's some of the things that they got because of the strike. Pensions of $100 monthly, including Social Security payments for employees of 65 with 25 years seniority. 
pension fund to be financed in the same manner as that of Ford with corporations payments reduced as Social Security benefits increase. $3,600 life insurance, sickness and accident benefits of $28 a week up to 26 weeks, hospital and surgical in-house hospital insurance equally financed by Chrysler and the employees, and a three-year contract, and that was unique in the auto industry at that time, providing for a voluntary dues checkoff system. It was a great victory for UAW workers. Richard Huddleston wrote that this victory was won by workers, their families, and support received from other unions, neighbors, and friends made the victory all the sweeter. For many years, photographs taken in the Newcastle during the long battle for pensions at the Chrysler hung on a bulletin board in the UAW Union Hall. And there's a picture here of union workers. And I'm not sure which one is Earl Todd. Does anybody remember that name at all? Apparently he's one at the right. Now this is touching. This is a letter to Walter Ruther. In 1961, Frank B. Tuttle, a retired rank and file auto worker who had been the first Chrysler pensioner in the United States under the contract won in 1950, wrote a letter to Walter Ruther. And that's Walter Ruther in the photo. On my 65th birthday in January 1950, I had three important messages before me from Social Security telling me that I had assured a life income of exactly $38.69 a month from Chrysler Corporation declaring it would never grant the preposterous pension demands of our union and one from you saying that those demands would be won either at the bargaining table or at the picket line. Chrysler managed to reverse the sequence. We went to the picket line first and the bargaining table afterwards. But today, I'm looking at pension checks of $157.46 a month. That's quite a difference, isn't it? Walter Ruther was angry about, about it, though. He says it shouldn't have come to this. According to historian Nelson Lichtenstein, when the strike was finally settled, Walter Ruther, angry that Chrysler had forced a protracted strike over actually funding a pension fund, refused to pose for the ritual handshake with Chrysler employees. I guess he was quite a guy. I'm uh, interested to learn more about him, but there's a footnote. Um, he died on Sunday, May 10th, 1970, and I remember my mother talking about that. Uh, I, can, I can remember how uh, shocked and upset she was. Ruther and his wife, May, left the Metro Airport on a six-passenger Lear jet around 7 p.m. on a rainy, cloudy night, heading to an airport near Pelston, Michigan, where a UAW car was to drive them to Black Lake. The plane flying low through the clouds to make its approach cliffed the tops of trees, nosedived, and burst into flames about miles from the airport. There were no survivors. Some have speculated that the jet's altimeter had been tampered with. Five years later, after those pensions were won, the Perfect Circle Company launched a fight to roll back the gains for workers. It was part of a fight against labor that raged all across America. A gentleman named Lothar Teeter, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing his first name right, brings Perfect Circle to Newcastle. In the early 1920s, Teeter inherited the company from his father, Charles. Under Lothar's leadership, the company established a foundry in Newcastle to make rough castings for the manufacturing plant in Hagerstown. <laughs> Lothar Teeter adopted the continuous mass production technology that had come to dominate the modern auto industry. These changes transformed the shop floor culture of Perfect Circle replacing the small-scale craft atmosphere of the past with modern efficiency-driven management practices. Base hourly wages were reduced but supplemented by piece rate bonuses. And then there's another change in leadership. This time Ralph Teeter took over. He was a cousin and he took over as president of Perfect Circle and led an expansion of the company. His conservative view of the world leaned heavily on an idyllic version of small-town America. Teeter believed that conflict between labor and management grew out of, quote, friction and petty irritations caused by the complicated nature of modern society. He thought that such conflict was much less likely in small town America. Boy, was he wrong, wasn't he? The Wall Street Journal reported by the 1950s, Perfect Circle was the nation's largest volume producer of piston rings. But the wages were another story. One fundamental issue 
but when the workers' complaints was wages. Wages for perfect circle workers were significantly less than those paid to factory workers at Chrysler. And this kind of gets to me too right here. In Newcastle, a significant number of perfect circle workers lived in the Belmont neighborhood. And it, everybody know where that is or kind of remember where that is? Located just south of the factory. Houses there were built on lots smaller than what was normally required by Newcastle City Code. They lacked access to city sewer lines and relied on outdoor privies. One of the union's goals was a company-wide contract with Perfect Circle covering all of its plants. Perfect Circle insisted on separate labor contacts, contracts with each plant, Hagerstown, Newcastle, and two in Richmond. The separate deals with each plant allowed room for Perfect Circle to play workers at one plant against workers at another. But instead of four contracts, all of a sudden Perfect Circle decides to terminate all four contracts. Richard Huddleston writes that Perfect Circle management fired the first shots, literally and figuratively, in what would become a battle that quite literally generated blood, sweat, and tears. In May 1955, the company terminated its four separate union contracts at each of its four plants. This action set in motion a series of steps culminating in a bitter strike that summer. On July 26, the first day of the strike, mass picketing by strike supporters prevented anyone from entering the plants. Two days later, Perfect Circle Company obtained an injunction from the Superior Court of Wayne County, where its Hagerstown and Richmond plants were located, limiting the number of pickets at Hagerstown and Richmond facilities to five people at any one time. With this injunction in place, workers not in support of the strike and some strike breakers hired by the company were able to enter these plants, allowing some production to resume. But the story was different in Newcastle. Early August 1955. August 1st, Perfect Circle obtained a similar injunction from the Circuit Court of Henry County against mass picketing at the Newcastle plant. However, in Newcastle, the order of the court was not consistently <coughs> obeyed. On August 5th, a group of pickets threw stones at cars of workers entering the plant and on August 15th, a large group of picketers stoned a bus carrying strike breakers into the plant. And there's a photo showing the, the damage to the bus. Adding fuel to a simmering fire. From the time it began on July 25th, 1955, there had been some minor violence associated with the perfect circle strike, but things had been fairly calm at the picket line. That all changed on the evening of Wednesday, October 5th. The company had fired 35 strikers earlier in the week for picket line violations. The firings apparently <coughs> sent a spark throughout the UAW CIO ranks in the entire state of Indiana. And an estimated 3,000 demonstrators massed before the foundry on Wednesday, October 5th, and marched on some 100 non-strikers inside the plant. The firings came on the heels of the negotiation stalemate in which union demands for a 21 cent an hour wage package was rejected. Perfect Circle, which had been paying an average wage of $2.06 an hour, offered only an 11 cent increase. So they were kind of far apart there. <clears throat> this turned out to be much bigger than the Newcastle plant. Union management issues were simmering nationwide, and when an agreement here couldn't be reached with Perfect Circle and its union, what should have been a small local dispute that Mr. Teeter talked about became a regional and national issue. Regional and national unions began to use Newcastle as a staging area to make a nationwide statement. The town found itself in the middle of a struggle that went far beyond the workers at the plants and local leaders. Here's the front page of the Courier Times, Wednesday, October 5th, 1955. The headline just jumps out at you, doesn't it? Six shot as mob storms PC. They called it Black Wednesday. This is from the Courier Times, October 5th, 1955. An attempt by strikers of the Perfect Circle Company, aided by more than 2,000 CIO workers from several <laughs> states, to storm the gates of the plant shortly after 10 a.m. resulted in the most serious riot in the history of this city. At least five persons were injured, four by bullet wounds, and one was hit on the head with a rock. 
While many CIO workers from Chrysler and some from the Ingersoll Steel Division of Borg Warner observed a work holiday, overall it resulted in a Black Wednesday for Newcastle. And there was gunfire exchange, and this is how that happened. The company had stocked the plant with firearms in what it called a perfectly legal defensive measure taken with full knowledge of law enforcement authorities. Perfect Circle officials did not deny that the first shots of the Perfect Circle strike came from within the plant. Nor did the UAW here deny that the demonstrators answered that gunfire with weapons of their own. Charles Garver was editor of the Henry County News Republican. How many remember the News Republican? He was editor in 1955 and he was a talented journalist. Uh, I wish I'd had a chance to meet him. I never met him. Whose stories were also featured by some of the wire services at the time. And here's a couple of comments he made. If we were to try to check on all the rumors that have been circulating here since Black Wednesday, we'd get nothing else done. There are a blue million of them, some nine million, 999,999 of which are false. What happened here on Wednesday, October 5th was the worst thing outside the tornado that ever happened to Newcastle and may possibly be the worst thing to happen in the United States this year. But even so, it could serve a mighty useful purpose despite its bloodshed, tension, and terror if it brings to a head the matter of which will win out, law or mob rule. Gentlemen, here I had a chance to work for Scott Chambers, son of Walter S. Chambers, Sr. He was editor of the Courier Times for 50 years, and this is what he said about Black Wednesday. We, the people of Newcastle, can mark October 5th on our calendar as the day Newcastle lost its good name. News of the violence in the city was given first place in the newspapers of Indiana and was spread in every newspaper across the country. Even the press associations of other countries published it. Two newspapers in London phoned the Courier Times for more details. All of the attention is a distinction without honor. The events which took place in Newcastle yesterday were shameful. Mobs and violence have no place in a decent community. Walter Ruther was on the cover of Time magazine in June of 1955, and this is his response to the Perfect Circle strike. Representatives of the Perfect Circle company opened fire on UAW CIO members gathered before the plant in support of Perfect Circle strikers without warning. Some of those who did the shooting were recognized as supervisory employees and can be identified as witnesses who were present at the scene of this violence. Of course, both sides blame the other. Perfect circle attorney, what did you expect those people to do? Lie down and be slaughtered? But the UAW said, we are of the belief that you are putting production ahead of the human element and human lives. The perfect circle strike got national, even international attention. This is the cover of Life magazine uh, on October 17, 1955, and there's a story in that issue entitled Old Style Labor War about the Perfect Circle Strike. The Christian Science Monitor got involved as well, and two newspapers in London, England, as we said earlier, called The Courier for more details. It's interesting that there was some state political gamesmanship over the Perfect Circle Strike. Indiana Lieutenant Governor Harold Handley was the one that sent 200 state troopers to Newcastle and helped bring a ceasefire uh, the governor at that time, George Craig, was in Florida. And he didn't want to be one-upped by, by Lieutenant Governor Hanley. They didn't like each other. And uh, so phoning from Florida, Governor Craig, Hanley's bitter rival, one-upped the Lieutenant Governor, and he's the one that called in the National Guard with the tanks. <clears throat> Mayor Paul McCormick tries to intervene. This 1950s photo, and this is not related to the strike, it's just something that I found, shows McCormick in the middle with Walter Barker and Edward Clift. Mayor McCormick brought both sides to the conference table that Thursday for the first time in a month. He opened the day-long session in an outwardly confident mood, but by late afternoon, he looked haggard and despondent. 
as he watched the Union delegation march out of the conference room. James Mitchell was the U.S. Secretary of Labor at that time. And he, his comment, he said today, violence at the Perfect Circle Corporation plant at Newcastle, Indiana was deplorable, and the federal government is watching the situation closely. Mitchell said the National Rela Labor Relations Board had decided to expedite proceedings brought in the labor dispute between the company and the CIO United Auto Workers. He also told a news conference the Federal Mediation Service has sent another mediator from Chicago to Newcastle to help try to settle the violence-ridden case. Meanwhile, National Guard is ordered to keep peace in Newcastle. That had to be a surreal scene uh, back in those days. Uh, I can remember my dad telling me that they used to drive from Moreland to Newcastle uh, on Saturdays to do their grocery shopping and uh, he remembers the car being stopped and they checking his trunk to see what he had in it. Uh, Newcastle was under modified martial law on October 6th with 600 Indiana National Guardsmen ordered to preserve order after Wednesday's riot at the Perfect Circle Foundry where the updated was, version was 10 persons hurt, 9 from gunfire. All roads leading into the city were patrolled by guardsmen and cars were halted for drivers to give their identification and state their reasons for coming to Newcastle. Here's the front page of the Courier, October 6, 1955. City is under martial law. What did martial law mean? Well, you could still have your club and lodge meetings. Theaters were open as usual. Church services were held as usual. But if you were uh, fond of the alcoholic drink, you were out of luck. Sale of alcoholic beverages in taverns, clubs, packages, liquor stores, and drug stores were banned. And this is what gets to me. Athletic contests were banned. Uh, being a sports fan, that drives me crazy. Mm -hmm. And then dances were also banned. It was the first time the National Guard had been on duty in Newcastle since the 1917 tornado. Um, that was March 11, 1917, and that was a terrible time. It left 21 people dead, 500 homes destroyed, more than a million dollars in damage. The photo here shows workers at Benthe's Greenhouse, one of many destroyed that day, altering Newcastle's Rose City image forever. Friday, October 7, 1955, the Executive Committee of the Newcastle Ministerial Association met this morning to consider prayerfully the part the church should play in the conflict that has come to our community. The committee offered ministerial services in any way they may be used in finding a Christian solution to our present difficulties. We further urge that every church in the city observe a special time of prayer Sunday morning to seek divine guidance, remembering that each of us stands under the judgment of God. The front page of the Courier above that uh, talks about how the National Guard is not going anywhere, it's staying. And then the rose window, that was the rose window of the original St. Anne Catholic Church, and I believe that window is now part of the current St. Anne Catholic Church. Front page of the Courier Times, Saturday, October 8, 1955. Craig, action is key for PC. This was, these big headlines were days and days and days, you know. You don't see headlines like that much anymore. And I guess maybe we should be thankful. Front page of the Courier Times, October 10th, 1955. Full martial law imposed. Tuesday, October 11th, 1955. The PC foundry reopens. Some 80 persons entered the Perfect Circle Foundry this morning under the watchful eyes of the Indiana National Guard and legal number of five pickets. It was the first day of full martial law, but businesses operated as usual and there were no restrictions for shoppers. Four tanks sat on the foundry parking lot facing the plant where about 90 non-strikers non were evacuated by state police last Wednesday. Here's the front page of the Courier on Tuesday, October 11, 1955. No end in sight for martial law here or Hagerstown as guardsmen leave Wayne. Trick-or-treat was even affected. Um, 
there was a uh, decision made by the powers that be that, that because of the strike, uh, we shouldn't have kids running around with masks on, you know, because things were still pretty unsettled. And so that impacted the trick-or-treat celebrations that year. Front page of the Courier Times on Thursday, October 20th, 1955. Martial law end ordered. And then they were leaving 150 soldiers to stay behind just as a precaution. So maybe things are getting better. Well, they thought they were. Front page of the Courier Times, Thursday, November 2nd, 1955. Hopes brighten for a PC accord with two sessions booked. So the powers that be are talking to each other. Front page, November 3rd, 1955. PC voting in three units is November 10th. Meetings at standstill for one week. So, you know, can you imagine what that must have been like to be sitting on edge and wondering, okay, are they going to approve this? Are they going to reach an agreement? Uh, if they reach an agreement, will the union approve it? Uh, had to be a very uncertain time. Front page of the Courier Times, Tuesday, November 15th, 1955. Things were starting to get ugly again. The mayor asked the governor to rescind the order for withdrawing troops. He decided that we still need the troops. Things are still very unsettled. Front page, November 17th, 1955. Guard prepares to go as PC incidents flare. Eight windows smashed in night blow. Front page, November 21st, 1955. Three PC non-striker homes struck by night blast. So it just continued on and on and on. It just didn't seem like there was going to be an end to it. Um, and then here's a word that when I saw this, I thought, how sad. Front page of the Courier Times, Tuesday, November 22nd, 1955. Terrorism acts reached total of six. Now this was way before 9-11. And they're talking about terrorism. But that's what it was, I guess. That's, that's probably how it felt. Front page of the Courier Times, Thursday, November 24th, 1955. Guardsmen returned to the city. So things were getting better. There was hope. And then all of a sudden, things are out of control again. And finally, more than four months later, 18-week PC strike is over. Newcastle local members okay new contract by margin of 86 to 72. And even that was closer than you might think it would be after all the violence and everything, but there still were people that were not satisfied. Here's what Perfect Circle workers won during that long and bloody uh, I I exchange. They won a two-year contract, 10 cent hourly wage increase, additional 7 cent boost after July 1st, Compromise on the 39 release strikers, uh, the, they had been arrested. 20 were reinstated immediately, 8 others reinstated after 30 days, and 7 other cases were sent to the arbitration table. Interesting side notes. A Santa house, funded and built by local union officials, had been used as makeshift police headquarters at the strike site until workers complained. You see, that Santa house was built by the union, and they built it specifically for Santa, and so they complained, and probably rightly so, and so Mayor Paul McCormick agreed to make other arrangements for the police. This is an interesting story, an honest face. John H. Morris, former judge, tells this one on himself when he was halted by the National Guard on Indiana 3 coming into the city. The guard asked for the key to the trunk, and Judge Morris said he would have to shut off the motor, inasmuch as the key to the trunk was in the ignition. He handed the key to the guard, and upon returning it to Judge Morris said, you have an honest face, so I will leave your machine gun in your trunk. <laughs> this one is really funny. Southbridge, Massachusetts. News about the perfect circle labor dispute had something of a two-way stretch in a Southbridge, Massachusetts newspaper where a headline read, Perfect Girdle Strike. As, as uh, my, my, my wife, who's very detail-oriented, will tell you, somebody didn't proffered that very well. <laughs> somebody goofed and setting the type, reports Marianne Tien, Southbridge librarian and former Newcastle resident. Perfect Girdle Strike. 
The strike aftermath, Perfect Circle became Dana Corp in 1963. Operations ceased in Hagerstown in 1995, exactly 100 years after they began. The Newcastle Dana plant eventually became Grady and it is still operating today. Final thoughts. The Perfect Circle strike was a black eye on the city of Newcastle and unfairly cast a shadow over the city for far too long. The vast majority of union workers, I believe, and it's just my personal opinion, were more like my dad than the men creating havoc during that awful time in 1955. Hopefully tonight's presentation puts into perspective some of the overlooked causes that created a perfect storm for Perfect Circle. When I think of my dad, and this is a picture of dad when he was in the service, he was a World War II veteran, stormed the beaches of Normandy. When I think of my dad and all the other hard-working, good-hearted men who were part of this factory town, as it has been called, I think of the song they played at my dad's funeral, Alan Jackson's Small Town Southern Man. Raised on the ways and gentle kindness of a small town southern man. And he bowed his head to Jesus, and he stood for Uncle Sam, and he loved only one woman. He was always proud of what he had. He said his greatest contribution is the ones you leave behind, raised on the ways and gentle kindness of a small town southern man. Callous hands told the story for this small town southern man. He gave it all to keep his family together and keep his family on his land, like his daddy. Years wore out his body, made it hard just to walk and stand. You can break the back but you can't break the spirit of a small town southern man. And in the spirit of a lot of small town southern men and women, uh, that is my presentation on Perfect Circle Strike and uh, uh, God bless them. Uh, you know, it was a greatly misunderstood time and hopefully tonight's presentation maybe shed some light on some, some, some factors that perhaps you haven't heard about. I sincerely appreciate everyone coming tonight and uh, uh, would take any comments, stories, or questions at this time. Yes, sir. I assume they didn't bring National, they brought National Guard members from outside here in County, didn't they? Yeah, I think it came uh, from, um, well, I guess I'm not really sure where it came from, but I think it was outside Henry County. I yeah. Think they used local because uh, no, they no, yeah, 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 yeah that's true. Gene, you know any more about that or? Um, no, I don't. I knew a guy. Gary from Portland. And he was do you know? Oh, really? No, I do not. That's uh, that was quite a presentation, Daryl. Uh, our family, my wife and I, raised six kids here in Newcastle, and I'm proud to say I'm a 34-year member of the UAW. And I thank God for the pension, and we were able to get all six of our kids through college. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm someone here that stands for a testimonial to what the union can do for the people. Now this is, of course, was a black eye for years, but they had to get there to get the pension. You can see as you look through the reasons why they were... Uh, being so hard nosed about what they wanted, uh, they needed it. But, you know, it was hard to hard to raise a family on what they were being paid, and and so you could certainly understand that. Now, you know, my dad, he would never condone violence. I mean, he fought in the war, and he was a town marshal for several years. Uh, I tell you what, though, if you uh, challenged him, or if you were doing something that you shouldn't be doing, or if you were doing something to one of his kids or family members, he'd fight like heck, um, you know, but, but uh, he, uh, he definitely uh, would not have condoned what happened at uh, Perfect Circle Strike. And then your comment, sir, I remember that, that uh, brought to mind that there was a gentleman that I talked to years ago, his name was David Williams, and he was a pastor. He was pastor of uh, the, um, uh, oh gosh, Becky, what was Margaret's church? St. James, St. James Episcopal Church. And uh, he was pastor of that church, and I, and I was talking to him one time. He was a National Guard soldier or troop here during the Perfect Circle strike. And it just blew me away. I mean, you know, here, here I'd known him for a while, and we just got to talking one day, and so he, he started telling me about it. And, uh, 
And a lot of what he said kind of backs up the fact that it was, it was more than, than uh, just uh, local people uh, causing trouble. It was, it was a lot of outsiders. Are there records of the people that were working during the strike that were allowed to go in? That's an interesting question. I don't know. Um, uh, I tell you what, if you want to write down your email address and give it to us, we'll do a little research. Uh, uh, that might be something that you could find out. Does anybody have any other stories that they want to share? Um, again, it was kind of a fascinating dive into, into everything that happened uh, during that time. And, and, you know, again, you hate to hear or you hate to see terrorism uh, in a headline about your hometown. Uh, but I, I guess that was pretty accurate at that time. You know, it was, uh, people kind of lost their heads and, 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 you know, uh, I was thinking as I was putting this together that uh, some of the out-of-state people came and it was really a good excuse for them to, to raise heck and get away with it. And they didn't have anything vested in this community. You know, they weren't, they didn't have kids here. They didn't uh, support the, the ball teams. Uh, they didn't uh, contribute to the United Fund. Uh, they didn't have any skin in the game. But, uh, uh, you know, they sure created a lot of trouble. And it was easy to do that, I guess, create trouble and then leave. Yes, sir. One of the things that, uh, that came out of the 1950 strike was the village of Mount Lawn was created. That's where most of the strikers went out there because they couldn't afford it. If you went out to Mount Lawn, they would put you to work farming or working at the racetrack, at which my dad did that. And that's why we become to live in Mount Lawn where I was raised. So the 1950 strike, because like in 48 or 49, there were very few people out there. And by the middle 1950, 51, 52, I saw some records last night where there were 100 people lived out in Mount Lawn in the, ca in the cabins and worked for the swaggers until the strike uh, was uh -huh. over. Your dad's name was Sterling, wasn't yes. it? Is that right, Sterling? Yeah, Mount Lawn has quite a history in and of itself, and uh, Gene and I were just talking about that. We need to do something similar, uh, maybe a presentation sometime about the history of Mount Lawn and all that went on out there. So, yeah, David. The one of the, the bad things that came out of all of this was in the late seventies and early eighties. Um, as a business owner here in the community that was a non-union shop, we had roughly 30 employees. Whenever someone would come to Newcastle looking for uh, an opportunity to build a plant or to expand or something like that, if I happened to be one of the guys that the chamber would send people to talk to on how do you get along in a small town um, what's the labor situation here? And I had really good things to say about Newcastle and the opportunities here. But every single person they sent to me before they got out of the office would say, but what about the riots? What about the shootings? What about this? What about... And it was all bad news. And we're talking about people not from Henry County, not from Indiana necessar necessarily, but that was the reputation that we were having to live down. It's very sad that yeah. something like that uh, could have that kind of impact decades later. I hope we're past that now. Um, of course, I don't know, the union presence isn't as strong here as it once was, um, but, uh, you know, the bottom line is, uh, uh, We've all got to work together, and uh, I hope that uh, that stain gradually disappears. But, you know, I think think it has somewhat. I, uh, Dick, what do you think? I mean, you were on the county council for years, and I think it's pretty much forgotten today. But, yeah, you were talking about uh, memories. I was an eight-year-old uh, when the strike, uh, the 
perfect circle strike was on. We were coming in from Morrow, where my grandfather lived, and my dad told the three boys to shut up, sit still. <laughs> he was a, an army vet too, and he didn't know anything. <coughs> but uh, we were all excited because you know we'd always played army in the backyard as kids, mm -hmm. and these were real soldiers, and we we couldn't wait to to watch them in action, mm -hmm. going through Dad's trunk. There was no guns in his trunk. I don't think. <laughs> Yeah, that had to be surreal as a little kid to um, see the the soldiers in your hometown and and, the, and see tanks of all, all things, you know. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, Gary? I think, uh, Gene and I both remember toward the end of uh, the Chrysler Corporation uh, tenure here in Newcastle, we had uh, uh, what was known as the Modern Operating Agreement and the uh, idea behind that was that uh, we would try to, uh, union and management would try to come together and uh, we would divide into work teams and uh, prior to this type of agreement management would decide how things were to be done and then they would direct the workforce to do it. In the new con uh, concept under the team, management and the team would get together and a lot of times the worker on the line knew more about what was going on on that job than anybody else, and they had some useful suggestions. So there was a, there was a time there when uh, uh, there were powers that be were seeking this cooperation, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. It, it still didn't save the plant, uh, but I think it was a, it was a beneficial. Probably extended it, I bet, for a yes. few years. Oh, yeah, yeah. Was, they yeah. told us right up front. They said that uh, there's a there's an opportunity here. Uh, if you adopt this team concept, we will put uh, more work and more machinery in this plant. And I believe, for the most part, the union uh, lived up to that agreement, and as did the management. Yeah, you look at that time in the 90s, and you can see, gosh, Newcastle had come a long way in terms of uh, management labor relations. Because uh, I remember those were good days. You guys yeah, won the... Work. But you guys won the uh, Productivity Award, Richard Luger. That was Sen just what I was going to ask. Senator Richard Luger came to yeah, the plant. Yeah, Senator Richard I'm, Luger came. I'm sure, someplace I still have that medallion because he gave everyone in the plant. Did he really? He wow. Yeah, I had a chance to cover I'm that for the paper. That. And where is that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. Gary probably got his. <laughs> Somewhere. <laughs> Well, I appreciate everyone that uh, uh, has worked in a factory. Uh, I, I don't know that I would have survived it. Um, my, uh, my brother, Ron, he worked at uh, General Motors like my dad did when Ron was in college. And Ron helped pay part of his way through. Uh, I was totally dependent on dad. And, uh, um, you know, having said that with Ron, though, Ron was working at General Motors, so you could easily argue that a union helped him get through school, too, because he had a union job. So, um, well, I sincerely appreciate everybody coming tonight and uh, would welcome any more stories if you have them. Uh, um, I'll make a, an announcement. I guess I, I had said at the last presentation, you know, these presentations don't come without commercials. And uh, the commercial I have tonight is that uh, uh, the booklet that we put together for the bicentennial this day in Henry County history, the second edition or second printed edition is, is in progress and sh we're hoping it'll be out uh, before the Christmas holiday season is over. Watch the newspaper, watch Facebook uh, for announcements. Uh, there'll be $10 and all the money goes to uh, help the Henry County Historical Society, which is the oldest continuously operating historical society and museum in the state. So, uh, so that'd be a great Christmas gift, last second for somebody, or, or maybe give yourself a Christmas gift. What I did in that booklet was I have a historical tidbit for every day of the year, 365 days. And then uh, I went through the alphabet, A to Z. I said, how Henry County has made history from A to Z. And it has over 500 pictures in it. Uh, the late Mike Bertram uh, had put a lot of old photos on a computer drive. 
And uh, talk about a kid in a candy store. I mean, I got those at my fingertips now, you know. And then Doug Majors, Doug and I have known each other since uh, our News Republican days. Uh, my wife Becky and I had the uh, Henry County News Republican. We were the owners from 82 to 86. And that's where I met Doug. And Doug totally changed uh, my life in a way because I really wasn't that interested in local history till I met Doug. And, uh, and now I'm kind of obsessed with it. Um, and Doug has been so good to share photos and, and uh, uh, anytime we've got a question, we call Doug and he, he's just very, very receptive. And a lot of these pictures tonight that you saw here came from Doug as well. So, so, so watch for those booklets. Uh, the Henry County Historical Society is going to be uh, active uh, next year for sure. We're going to have a lot of exciting things coming. Uh, Kay Ford, my co-director cohort back there, and I uh, are excited about the future. Um, Gene Ingram is a terrific leader with our, with our board. And uh, we've got Kathy out there uh, uh, that's a tremendous volunteer, a board member. And uh, got Vicki, Vicki Graham. Who else am I missing? Did I get them all? Dick. Oh, yeah, yeah, Dick Bouslog. Yeah, he's sitting here right in front of me. He's sitting here right in front of me. It, you know, it, it's, it's a terrific organization, and I'm, I'm so proud to be a part of it and uh, uh, proud to be a, a link in this grand historical journey that started in uh, 1902, I think, when this... Uh, uh, Historical Society was, was uh, started here in this facility. I think the Historical Society, K okay, dates back to 1886, doesn't it? Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, do you know, is there a lot of other photos, and is there any way we can get access to see of, of the perfect circle? There are more photos here, I think. Uh, I tell you what, come in sometime and... and uh, uh, We'll, we'll see if we can find some more for you. Um, there are some files here, and uh, uh, there might be some, some pictures and some other booklets that we have. I met Doug before, and he told me that we just, we just haven't been able to. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, uh, yeah, yeah. Come, come see us sometime. Uh, um, uh, we're open 1 to 4.30, Tuesday through Friday. And you can also call and make an appointment. Um, uh, call us 529-4028 and leave a message and we'll be happy to get back with you. But yeah, I could show you some more things. Yes, sir. Donations. Yeah, don't forget the donations. It's Christmas time and if you um, wanna give a Christmas gift to a very deserving organization, I'm here to tell you this one is it. Uh, uh, this place gets more done with fewer people than anything I've ever seen. And, uh, and again, this, you know, we're sitting in an area here where General William Gross used to, used to spend his evenings, uh, used to sit at the desk over there. Um, kind of gives you goosebumps in a way to think about uh, if you could turn back the hands of time and, uh, or maybe they sing around the Christmas tree and uh, Artie Ratliff had got us a beautiful Christmas tree this year. It's uh, spectacular. <laughs> also, if you want genealogy research, Miss Kay Ford is the lady to see. She definitely is. She she knows. Talk about someone who knows the paths and the tracks and and uh, can find things that you wouldn't believe. You know, if if genealogy is something you're interested in. Uh, give us a call. Uh, make an appointment with Kay. Uh, uh, I really enjoyed working with Kay. Well, we've had a we had a good time since I became the co-director about a little over a year ago. So I can attest to Kay's skill. She's oh. top notch. She's the one that found Robert Indiana's birth certificate. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anybody else have anything or? Gene, have I forgotten anything? I think we've covered it. Just All don't right. forget the donation thing. Yeah, yeah, we've got uh, we've got a little little box out front if there. If you like haven't eaten lights on tonight, the donation box. Oh, yeah, you got Kathy, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah, but I'm saying don't forget the, the, the member members. 
Yeah, we do have a special on our life memberships. They're $100. And uh, for $100, you can become a life member. And uh, we've got some, we're talking about maybe developing a magazine. Um, I think that would be a lot of fun to do. There's so many different things you could write about. And again, I'm a kid in a candy store with these pictures. And uh, now, how many look at our Facebook page on a regular basis? Um, we have a Facebook page, and on that Facebook page, every day, I've been doing it now for over a year, I post a This Day in Henry County History. And I usually have a photo with it. Sometimes I have an article with it. Uh, the one I posted today, and I was a little late posting it today because I was working on this, but um, it was on this date in 1944 that the very first first aid unit run was done. Uh, there, was a, there was a lady having a baby, and Chuck Wood got in his panel dodge truck, 1942 panel dodge truck, and raced to the scene and helped her out. And uh, so I posted that today, and that post also, I found a column by Miles Marshall about Chuck Wood, and it's beautiful. It's beautifully written, and it talks about Chuck and how he was a lifesaver even before he became involved with the first aid unit. So there's a little tease. If you're uh, on Facebook, uh, I'll look that up tonight, uh, and, and, uh, and, you know, like our page and and uh, uh, become a follower of Facebook, uh, the Henry County Facebook page. We've got some, some interesting things there. Kate posts some things occasionally, too. So um, we're doing some things and trying to make sure that uh, history is, is, uh, is a present mind. Uh, we're not forgetting history, and uh, uh, we don't intend to. So, Yes, sir? Volunteers. If, if you like what you heard tonight and if you uh, enjoy being in the museum and enjoy history, we could use your help. Uh, we're always looking for volunteers. Um, uh, let us know if you're interested. And uh, volunteering can range from anything from helping us with office duties um, to um, uh, maintenance around this particular museum, to leading tours, uh, to talking about uh, historical topics that you might be interested in. So um, we'd be glad to have anyone here that wants to volunteer to join us. You would name your own hours, what days, no heavy lifting. <laughs> mention I do all the heavy lifting. Yeah, you might want to mention one of our good, really Oh my goodness, Mitch, here. yeah. Mitch and Brad both back there. Mitch, Mitch is the guy that does it all basically, and uh, uh, Brad has been Mr. Tech for us. Um, uh, he's helped us with these PowerPoint presentations and uh, with the microphone issue. And uh, gosh, he's Brad. You made me sound better than I thought I could tonight. So the, the audio is perfect. Yeah, also takes care of our computers. Uh, takes care of our computers. Yeah, he's the man. Do we miss anybody? Kay, do we miss anybody? I'd like to thank Scott Frost and his group for allowing us to do the Bicentennial. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's been fantastic, Scott. Uh, let's give Scott a round of applause. I think, I think the, uh, the whole year has been just a, just a real thrill. Um, and uh, I know a lot of work has gone into it and, and all the events. And uh, thank you, Scott. Uh, We've had fun all year. And last but not least, we'd like to thank Daryl. Excellent presentation. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I've been uh, kind of obsessed with this stuff for quite a while. My wife can attest to that. So, Well, Merry Christmas, everybody, and uh, Happy Holidays. And uh, we wish you the very best, and be sure and come back and see us sometime.